It's so cool to see real love displayed in our church and in our community. And that's the series we have been in, Real Love. And today we're going to be in 1 John chapter number 4, chapter number 4. If you have a blue Bible like this one, we're going to be on page 744 and page 745 as we look at that together. And the big idea as we kick off into the fourth chapter is this wonderful tool. You can follow along on the message all the way through. There's a spot where you can write the big idea. And the big idea is Jesus is the full expression of God's love. Jesus is the full expression of God's love. As a brief recap, we looked at when we launched this series who John was. John was an apostle. He was one of Jesus' disciples, one of his followers, and he writes this letter. He writes this letter, and he also writes the Gospel of John. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you have Revelation, which is the very last book of the Bible. He's the author of all those books and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so we kicked off this series in 1st John. John is a little older in his age, and there are churches that are being launched. There's a movement going on all over the place. At this particular time, it was in a place called Asia Minor, which is kind of modern-day Turkey, if we looked at it in today's terms. And this church is booming. It's a house church. They're growing, doing great things. But the culture is trying to infiltrate this church. And so with that, there is a lot of doctrine and teaching that are starting to enter into this church that are causing them to question who Jesus is and what did really Jesus say about this commandment to love. And there was this teaching going on that said everything that has to do with the spirit, with God, is good, and everything that has to do with the flesh, our bodies, is bad. And so they were saying there's no way that Jesus could come in a real body because if he's God, then he's good, but our bodies are bad. And so there's this this teaching that began to say that Jesus didn't come in a real body. And that's why John is very clear in chapter 1, no, I'm an eyewitness. I saw him. I saw his mission. We beheld his glory to help this church understand that Jesus came in a real body. Because here's what happens is if you have that dichotomy of spirit good, flesh bad, you have those people that as they began to get more spiritually mature than others in the church, they thought they were above sin. Uh, We can't sin. On the other end, flesh bad, if you stay there, then hey, we're, we're doomed anyway. We can just do whatever we want to. And so, no, John writes them and lets them know through this test, hey, here are some questions you can ask yourself to get back on track. What does the person believe about Jesus as he came in the flesh? How does this person respond to the commandments of love? And how do we love other Christians? And so he provides answers to all of those questions to help them steer the direction of where they were headed to move away from this false teaching. And we have it in our culture. There are a lot of things that try to get us to discredit what we believe and and who we are in Christ. And we can learn from this letter how to get refocused and have Jesus be the fullest expression of love in us today. So let's pick it up in uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1, John is writing, and he says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. See, he even reemphasizes it, that Jesus came in a real body. Then he goes on to say, but if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has a spirit of the Antichrist. We talk with that, an Antichrist, anything that we put in the place of Jesus, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. Then he says, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won the victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them. But we belong to God and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. So right out the gate, he's trying to let them know Jesus is real. And this teaching that they're trying to infiltrate the church with is fake, real versus fake. And we live in a culture where we still have that struggle over what's real and what's over faith. And even how we express ourselves, we can have that struggle. Anybody know anybody that has an infectious laugh? I mean, when this person starts laughing, you start laughing, and it's not even funny. What you think they're laughing is not even funny, but because they start laughing, you start laughing. 
Kim's aunt like that. Her name is Harriet. She is like that. Every time she starts laughing, she gets this tone in her laugh where it's like, he, 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 and everybody begins to laugh when Harriet is really tickled. But on the flip side of that, there's also times we don't laugh for real. We have fake laughs. Ever heard a joke that kind of went this way and you're just like, ha, 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 not really funny? So we have ways to mask our true expression. My daughter, she's in eighth grade. Her name is Kaylani. goes to Fairview Middle School. She says that there are still people trying to offer her fake pieces of gum. So they'll take a Wrigley's pack of gum, take the silver wrapper, make it like it look like there's a piece of gum, stick it in there and offer it to her. She said she pulled it out and nothing was there. It was fake. And I didn't even know they still did that. They did that when I was in junior high 20 years ago. But they had different ones. They were booby traps, and they had like a little mouse trap. So if you pat it, it would pop your fingers. So yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I'm glad she doesn't have any pop fingers. But there are things in our lives that are fake, and they are in our face all the time, trying to, to get us to mask who we are, to mask our expression. And so we have ways of hiding how we express ourselves. It's a fake laugh, a fake smile. And unfortunately, John is trying to help us see, unfortunately, those things don't keep, they keep us from being who we can fully be in Jesus Christ because God's full expression is found in Jesus. And he lets us know that God and Jesus, these things are real and we don't have to be fake. We don't have to have all these fake impressions. We don't have to have a fake smile, a fake laugh. We don't have to have a fake piece of gum. We can have a real Jesus and that real Jesus can be fully expressed in us as we love the world, love each other, and love God. And so what does that look like? How do I know that I have the full expression of Jesus working in me? Three quick things we wrote down. The first one I wrote down is this, and you can write this down in your note sheet. The Holy Spirit guides your life. The Holy Spirit guides your life. There are a number of things in our culture, just as it was in John's time, that are trying to guide our lives. It can be our emotions. It can be our past. It can be pain. It can be our career. There's a number of things, and sometimes those things are very positive. It's okay to have a a great job where you feel passionate about what you do, but some, when we get, allow those things to guide our lives, we may not be at the fullest expression of what God wants us to be at. And so John encourages us to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our lives. He says it right in verse 13 of the fourth chapter. He says, and God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen it with our own eyes and now testify that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. And he says, all who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them and they live in God. Wow. When you say yes to Jesus, God's spirit comes and lives on the inside of you to guide you into all truth. Jesus even said, Jesus said, I have to go. I'm going back to my father, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has nicknames, comforter, to comfort you in your time of distress, helper, to help you when you need help, when you're at your lowest point. And Jesus sent that so that we would have power so that we can be witnesses and allow the Holy Spirit to guide our lives. Because you never know, you never know what kind of kingdom impact you can have when you allow the Holy Spirit to guide your life. You never know what dream can come to pass, what vision, what passion can be ignited by hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit to take a certain step and an opportunity open so people can see and hear who Jesus is. I'm reminded of Sharon Pastor. Sharon Pastor, she attends the Bremerton campus, and she likes to go to something called the Mother-Son Dance. I just now, I'm able to say that because I normally, I have three daughters, so I normally say daddy-daughter dance. So she wants to go to a mother-son dance. She registered for this thing, and it was full, sold out, but there were 50-plus moms and kids on the waiting and sons on the waiting list to get into this mother-son dance. And so she began to pray. God put something on her heart. She just didn't feel right. She began to pray, God, what can I do? What can I do to make this, this happen? And so she reaches out to those moms, reaches out to those moms on the waiting list and says, hey, what if? What if, God's put this on my heart, what if we do our own mother-son dance? And she just took a chance. I stepped out and took a risk in faith. Well, it turns out all of those 15-plus mothers on that wedding list said, hey, you know what? Thumbs up, we're in. And she began to email out. She has a plan in place on what it's all going to look like. She's so passionate. She talked to me and Mark, and we're going to host that thing in 2016 at the Bremerton campus. Yeah, mother-son dance. 
going to be awesome. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for that. Who knows what is inside of you that if you just allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you in truth, you can come to the fullest expression of who you are. Because who you are in Jesus Christ is what this community needs. And there is a need, there is a great need that we can meet if we follow the guiding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always lead us to love. The Holy Spirit will always lead us to grace, always lead us to truth. And those are the things that are real. And those are the things of the fullest expression of God's love in us through his son, Jesus Christ, as we follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So the first one is the Holy Spirit guides your life. But the second one is, how, do, how is Jesus fully expressed in me? Your confidence in the gospel grows. That's the second thing. Your confidence in the gospel grows. And as I begin to look at all of the current events, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, it's hard for me sometimes to have confidence in some things that I see and that I hear around me. I mean, I was just reflecting back on all of the tragedies and things that have happened. The shooting at a movie theater in Denver, various shootings in elementary schools and in universities and people losing their lives. I mean, people just trying to have Bible study in a church and they get gunned down. The San Bernardino is a, a town real close to my home. 14 people just lost their lives, bombing in Paris. I can keep going on and on and on about all the things that are happening around us and in our community and in our society. And we can get to a place where we're like, who can I trust? What can I put my confidence in. Where is the hope? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? And I love how John encourages us this morning how we can put our trust in God's love as we are surrounded with all these things trying to pull us in many directions. He says in verse 16, he says, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. The more we continue to live in God, our love grows. Our confidence in the gospel grows. Then he says, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. That's how my confidence in the gospel grows. In the midst of all this tragedy, in the midst of all this stuff going on, where it seems like there's a dead end, it seems like we can't get any traction, that we can't make it as a culture, as a society, as a community, I know that that's not the end. That can't be the end. Hatred and evil and bitterness and the things we wrestle with and sin and destruction, that can't be the end. There has to be a better story. There has to be some light at the end of the tunnel. And that's found in Jesus Christ. And who knows, even in tragedy, there can still be a better story when we put our trust in God's love and live like Jesus. Who knows that some of the tragedies I just mentioned would bring a community together and start a movement? Who knows that if you suffer something in your family, that that family can come together and relationships can be mended surrounding one tragedy where people thought there were no hope? Visit people all the time in the hospital where the diagnosis is not good. It's not good at all. But when you go visit them, they have a smile on their face. There's joy in their heart. And they still believe if it's not good, then God's not done. And there is a better story. And that's why Romans 8.28, it says it like this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. No matter what we are in or no matter what we face, we have an eternal hope. And John, he mentioned it in that first verse. He said, we have, we have hope. We have an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. We have eternal life. This is not the end. We can spend an eternity with Jesus. And with that, along the way, there's going to be trials and tribulations. But we have hope knowing it's not the end. And our confidence in the gospel grows. Why? Because there is a better story. And there are people out there right outside these doors in our community that are hurting, that are broken, that are searching for hope. And we can let them know no matter what, if it's not good, God's not done. He has a plan for your life. He can get some glory right now as the fullness of his love is expressed in you. But it starts with us loving each other and realizing the gospel grows in us, realizing that God has given us a story. 
God has given us a story. That's why sharing your story in community is so important because I get encouragement to know that my brother or my sister was struggling with X, Y, Z, and they began to trust God, and God was able to give them peace and contentment. And when I hear that story, I get encouraged. And when I share my story, others get encouraged. And the gospel grows, and lives are transformed. And we experience the fullness of God through Jesus in us. So how is God's love brought to full expression in you? The Holy Spirit guides your life. Your confidence in the gospel grows. And thirdly, you don't live in fear. You do not live in fear. Now, there are some things that I am afraid of. I'll be honest, this is a safe place. There are some things I'm afraid of. If somebody comes through that door with an anaconda or some type of a snake, the message is over, I'm out of here. I don't want anything to do with snakes, nothing. I don't want to touch them, I don't want to hold them, nothing. Can you, if a movie has too many snakes, I turn it off. No, don't want to do it. And there are things in our lives that cause us to be afraid, that can cause us to live in fear. But unfortunately, when we live in fear, we can't experience the fullest of God's love. Fear and love cannot coexist, and I love how John explains that. He says in verse 18, such love, talking about God's love, has no fear, but perfect love expels all fear. One translation says it casts out all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. I love that, that perfect love cast out fear. When I realized the fullness of God's love, I don't have to be afraid. And I've had some experiences with fear in my life. I'm from Southern California, and my family, we used to fish at a place called Lake Paris. Anybody ever heard of Lake Paris before? All right, I got a couple of Southern California people. And it, was, it used to mess me up because as a kid, you know, we're going to Paris. So I'd be looking for the Eiffel Tower, and it's like, no, it's spelled P-E-R-R-I-S. And so it would rain on my parade. It was a lake with a lot of dry mountains around it. But they used to fish there and catch some wonderful fish. My mom and my grandfather and grandma and my aunt, my cousins, we'd go out there and fish. And they used to fish on this bank, standing on the bank, and me and my cousin would play on that bank. One day, I was running on the bank. My cousin was chasing me. I was running, and I was looking behind him as I was ahead of him. And then as I turn around, I'm in midair, off the bank, into the water, splash. I'm seven years old. He's five years old. I couldn't swim. And every time I tell this story, or every time I think about this story, I'm reminded of when I was under the water, I was like this looking for something. I didn't know what it was, but I'm just... And within three seconds, my mother, who can't swim, drops her poles, comes down the rock, and grabs my back with a G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip. She was not going to let go. Pulls me up out of the water. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. My little cousin who sees all this going down, he thinks it's some type of a game, or maybe we were doing baptisms. I don't know. So he comes, and he jumps off the bank too. Geronimo! He's in the water. My aunt has to drop her pole and go pick him up too. And as I think about that scene, which was very scary, I was afraid of water for a very long time. Very long time. I don't even know how the Navy accepted me. That's how afraid of water I was for a very long time. They didn't want anything to do with water. They didn't want to swim, none of that. And I had to begin to think, as I began to reflect on that and reflect on how my mother's perfect love in that moment, and if my mom was here, she'll tell you, there was no other real moment than love. When she grabbed me, I felt her perfect love. And as she grabbed me and pulled me out of that water, I knew I didn't have to be afraid because my mom was there to save me. And as I thought about that analogy and I thought about how God's love is made perfect and cast out all fear, no matter what I'm experiencing, no matter what I'm drowning in, I was reminded of a, a very famous Christian hymn that my grandmother used to sing. And it goes, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. When nothing else could help, when I was afraid, when I was alone, when I was by myself, when I felt outcast, love lifted me. And I don't know what you're afraid of today. I don't know what you walked in here with. I don't know what's on your heart. 
I don't know what you're struggling with, but today you can feel God's full expression of his love through his son, Jesus Christ, and you might be like this. Jesus can pick you up whatever you are in and say, I love you. I have a plan for you, and you can experience my full expression and be the person I've called you to be. You can come alive. You can come alive and heal this world. You can come alive and be a community that loves one another. We can come alive and be a light on a hill for those who are without hope can see the hope in Jesus Christ. Because we've realized the full expression. And we love one another. And he said it in the previous, in his, in his Gospel of John, he said, The world will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. When that love is fully expressed in us, we can fully express it to the world, and lives can be transformed and changed. Leads me to two questions as the band gets ready to come and we close down the message. You can write these down, and it's our prayer that you, ex- you know, explore these questions with your family, your friends, your loved ones, your small group. When have you experienced a full expression of God's love? Think back, follower of Jesus, think back over your life when you can say, you know what, this moment was a God moment when I was sinking and God grabbed me and pulled me out of whatever I was in. And then the second question is, who needs a full expression of God's love this Christmas? Who needs a full expression of God's love this Christmas? Pray that God would send somebody in your heart that may not be experiencing love, may be rejected, may be experiencing hatred, whatever it is. It's our prayers that we, as together collectively, Find people that don't experience God's love and they can see it in us because we love God and we love our neighbor. That leads me to our action step, and you can write this down. In this, in this season, as we head into Christmas, into the new year, be a full expression of God's love. Be a full expression of God's love. He says there as he closes out the chapter, if someone says, I love God, but helps a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we do not love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this commandment. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, we can have a full expression of God's love. We don't have to live condemned. We don't have to live outcast. We are forgiven. We are set free. We are made right with God through Jesus Christ. Our sins are paid for by what he did for us on the cross. And not only that, on the third day, he arose with all power in his hand. And because he has the power, you and I have been given the power to be guided by the Holy Spirit, to have confidence and know that the gospel will grow, and to realize we don't have to live in fear. Can we stand? I want to say a prayer for us, and after I pray, the host team is going to come and pass out communion. And go ahead and hold on to that. We'll sing a worship song together. But as a communion is passed out, I just pray that you would reflect on where you are with God's love, where you are with the full expression through Jesus Christ. And in this moment, ask God to fill you up so you can be all he's called you to be. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together. I thank you, God, for this opportunity to to hear and know through the letter of 1 John, the fourth chapter, that Jesus is the full expression of your love. And in this moment right now, God, we might be running on E, all the cares of life, all the baggage, all the things we have to deal with, the sin, the brokenness. We're asking right now that you fill us up. Fill us up so we can be that expression that you've called us to be. Fill us up so we can love one another and love our community. Fill us up so we can ignite that passion inside of our hearts and meet a great need that you've called us to. And God, I just say a special prayer right now for everyone under the sound of my voice, God, as we go into this Christmas season, show us, God, where it hurts. Show us, God, somebody who needs a full expression of your love. And because we love one another and because we love you and we love our neighbor, as that person sees your love working through us, they'll receive that love too. Why? Because that love is real 
It's not counterfeit. It's not fake. It's not a carbon copy. Your love is real. And we receive it right now. In Jesus' name. Amen.